morning. We gather as God's beloved children. We come together as a people whom Jesus calls into community. So this becomes a place where all are welcome. We have come to give thanks, to pray, and to sing, to be with one another and with the Lord. Let us worship God. Welcome to this time of worship on the Lord's Day here at the Wallace Presbyterian Church. It's good to be with all of you. Please take time to sign the friendship pad and greet one another in the name of Jesus Christ. Call your attention to announcements in the bulletin. Um, I'd like again to call your attention to the back a couple of weeks from now, our in-house retreat. I hope that you'll be able to come. Rachel Dole from Wilmington will be the leader for our adults. We'll have programs for the youngest children, Living Stones for the um, junior and senior highs for adults, and Rachel will be uh, preaching on Sunday morning. If you're planning on coming and eating supper, please fill out this reservation form, and you can put it in the offering plate or call Cheryl at the church office. On Tuesday of this week at 2 o'clock, there'll be another meeting of the long-term recovery group that's really getting traction here in Duplin County. We need some volunteers. Um, and it's not all muck and gut or rebuilding that kind of work. We're looking for people who have skills in grant writing. We need a treasurer. We need people who might be interested in organizing volunteers. Um, there are all sorts of things that can be done. So if you're interested, um, Tuesday at 2 o'clock back in the fellowship hall, we'll have another meeting of long-term recovery group. I'd like to share a letter that we received. It was addressed to me and to the congregation. It's from Dr. Austin Abasahan, who is the superintendent of Duplin County Schools. <clears throat> it says, Dear Dr. Gladden, as the Duplin County Schools family continues to recover from the effects of Hurricane Florence, we find ourselves strengthened with a renewed spirit of unity and hope as a result of the outpouring of support. On behalf of our Board of Education and the entire Duplin Schools family, I want to thank you and everyone at Wallace Presbyterian for all you have done to support students, families, and staff. Your generous assistance and most of all continued prayer have been a true blessing to so many. We are determined to grow stronger, to continue to grow stronger than ever before and we thank the good Lord for his many blessings. May he also continue to bless you and the entire congregation. Sincerely, Austin Obasahan, Superintendent. And speaking of which, if you happen to have maybe an hour tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock, that you could come up and help me sort through a rather large pile of donations, coats, hoodies, school supplies, all sorts of things that are right now in the pep room. If you could come up, depending on how many of us there are, it won't take a real long time, but just to organize them so that they can be delivered to the schools, it sure would be a big help. Tomorrow at 2 o'clock, could meet at the pep room and help me sort out a lot of wonderful contributions from lots of different places. We have a minute for mission today from Carol Steen about Presbyterian Women. Tomorrow uh, at 5.15 in the Blue Room is our first coordinating team meeting for the year. Now this would not be worthy of a mention perhaps if our year began in January, but our year begins in August and this will be our first coordinating team because finally I got it together. So <laughs> um, I hope to see all of you. Also Mary Lane is uh, looking for people who can fill out the year for um, as, as, an off, as officers in a couple of positions of people who are um, taking a break or who are, uh, have decided to leave our community. So I hope that uh, you can don't run from her if she approaches you and perhaps you could do a wonderful thing and approach her. Thank you. 
Please join me in the opening sentences that are printed in the bulletin. Peace be with you. Come and see the love God has given to us. Come with this hope that Christ's presence is real. Our first hymn is 188, Jesus Loves Me. sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if we confess our sins God is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness I invite you to join me in our responsive prayer confession or silent prayers in our responsive assurance of pardon let us pray together beloved we are God's children now but what we will be in the fullness of our time has not been revealed. What we do know is this, we will be like Jesus the Christ and saints of God. Let us consider how Jesus was revealed among us and pray to be more like the Christ in every way. Jesus embodied the unconditional love of God. We pray, may we be more like Jesus. Jesus fed those who were hungry we pray, may we be more like Jesus. Jesus drew near to those living on the margins and the excluded. We pray, may we be more like Jesus. Jesus brought healing and wholeness to those in need. We pray, may we be more like Jesus. Jesus hungered and thirsted for righteousness. We pray, may we be more like Jesus. Lord, hear our prayers. Beloved, through the love shown to us by Jesus, we can be sure that we are God's children now. The Spirit of Christ is among us in this gathering, and the nature of Christ is revealed within us. We are becoming more and more like Christ each day. Therefore, let us live joyfully as God's people, saints and instruments of God's way. Let us sing God's praises for his mercy in our lives. invite the children to join me on the steps for the children's sermon.
Well, it's just us guys today. Good morning. I brought some pictures to show you on my iPad of my family. You know who that is? Oh, that's you and your mom? That's me and my wife, but we don't look like that anymore, do we? No. Well, at least I don't. That's when we got married a long time ago. She still looks like that. And let's see, there's, there's a picture of us at a wedding. And let's see, you know who that is? No, I do not know who that is. You don't know who that is? Uh, she hadn't been around in a while. That's our daughter, Natalie. That's when she came home to visit one time. And let's see, you know who that is? That's my son, or our son, that's Jackson, yep, and let's see, um, that's my daddy, and he died a long, long, long time ago. I know, it's a very long, 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 long time ago. It was, it was way back in 1982 I, when he I died. I bet it was in the 1920s. No, actually, that's when he was born, <laughs> but he died in 1982. Now... Let's see what picture. Oh, here you go. That's a picture of, there I am, and that's my brother David, and that's my sister Susan, and that's my mama, and that's when she turned 95 years old. Ooh. That was two years ago. That was when we were having a birthday party for her. Let's see, and look, there's a picture of my mom and her, br her little brother, who is 93, sitting together. And let's see. Um, you recognize anybody in that picture? I recognize one person. Yeah, there's Madeline. Well, whoop. There's Madeline, and there's Elizabeth and Garrett. That's when we went to Montreat. Now, wait a minute. I, I thought I told you these were pictures of my family. They are my family. I bet Madeline. Yeah. My cousin. Who is that? Madeline is your cousin. That's Mr. Hank Bellamy. Mm -hmm. And that's when we were at Montreat. And, you know, whenever I see Hank, I say, hey, brother, how are you? Because he's like a brother to me. He's not really my brother, but he's just such a good friend. He's like my brother. And then let's see that picture. Yeah. There I am with Africa. the people in Africa. And they called me brother, and I called them brothers and sisters because we're all part of a family. Now look, I've got one more picture to show you. Look at that. You see anybody in there you know? Yes. Yeah. That's our whole congregation. That was taken a couple of years ago after worship one Sunday. And that's my family too. That's your family. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. That's your family. So. Everyone in the whole city is people's family. That's right. Everybody is the same family. Everybody but you think they're not. Thank you, Hollis. That's exactly right. We're all family. Especially if we're part of God's family, then we're brothers and sisters in Christ, and we're a family. You don't have to be born into the family, but you're a family, and so all those people out there are your family. And when you got baptized, carried you down that aisle, and I introduced you and said, this is Hollis Skidmore, this is Hayes Skidmore, this is Robert Coombs, and all of you are their family now. Aunts and uncles and cousins and grandparents and brothers and sisters. We got a million uncles. <laughs> you got a million uncles, that's right. And that's a wonderful thing, Hollis, to have that many family members. So I wanted to remind you that we're all children of God. And we probably, there's a probably gazillion people in the whole entire world. And they're all family. Yep. It's um, a big family. And guess what? If we add every family together, that will make it's okay, a trillion. A trillion, that's right. So just be glad that we have such a big family that we can love and that can love us. Let's pray together. Let's have a prayer. Dear God, thank you for our families for our sisters and our brothers and our moms and our dads that we live with and we grow up with. But thank you for the family in this church, for the trillion uncles and the gazillion cousins. And thank you for our family all around the world, even people we don't know, but they're our brothers and sisters because we're all children of God. We praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all.
Please join me in our prayer for illumination. It's printed in the bulletin. Let's pray together. All knowing God, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. Through your spirit, give us eyes to spot where you are here in this place. Give us ears that strain for your voice of encouragement. Give us minds to engage your challenge in our lives. Give us hearts of compassion, empathy, and love for our sisters and brothers around us. Amen. Our epistle lesson this morning is 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Our next hymn is 729, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. <laughs> passages for the sermons all came from the Gospel of Luke. We heard about John the Baptist. We heard about Mary's song when Gabriel told her she was going to have a child. On Christmas Eve, we heard the story of Christmas from Luke 2. The next week, we heard about um, Mary and Joseph presenting Jesus in the temple when he was a week old. We've heard about uh, Jesus' baptism last week. And I've planned out my preaching through the end of April through 
Easter and the week after, and they're all all the stories are going to come from Luke. So really, we're just kind of continuing the journey through Luke. And today's story is from Luke chapter 3, and it's an interesting scripture passage to read because it's Jesus' family tree. So I invite you to listen for the Word of God in Luke 3, 23 through 38. Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his work. He was the son, as was thought, of Joseph, son of Haley, son of Mathot, son of Levi, son of Melchi, son of Janai, son of Joseph, son of Mattathias, son of Amos, son of Nahum, son of Esli, son of Nagai, son of Maath, son of Mattathias, son of Simeon, son of Joseph, son of Jodah, son of Jonan, son of Risa, son of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, son of Neri, son of Melchi, son of Adai, son of Kosam, son of Elmadam, son of Er, son of Joshua, son of Eleazar, son of Jorim, son of Mathat, son of Levi, son of Simeon, son of Judah, son of Joseph, son of Jonam, son of Elikiam, son of Malia, son of Mena, son of Mattatha, son of Nathan, son of David, son of Jesse, son of Obed, son of Boaz, son of Salah, son of Nashon, son of Aminadab, son of Admin, son of Arni, son of Hezron, son of Perez, son of Judah, son of Jacob, son of Isaac, son of Abraham, son of Terah, son of Nahor, son of Serug, son of Ru, son of Peleg, son of Eber, son of Shelah, son of Canaan, son of Arphaxad, son of Shem, son of Noah, son of Lamech, son of Methuselah, son of Enoch, son of Jared, son of Mahalalil, son of Canaan, Kainan, son of Enos, son of Seth, son of Adam, son of God. May God bless the hearing and the reading of his holy word. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Beatrice Evans was a much beloved member of the Stanley White Presbyterian Church in Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina. She was that congregation's Eleanor Walker. Everyone called her Beat. Beat knew her Bible inside and out. One day she came to me and she said, Phil, I'd like for you to preach a sermon on Matthew 1, 1 to 17. I don't think I've ever heard a sermon preached on those verses. In case you don't know what those verses say, they contain Matthew's version of the begats. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat Judas and his brothers. I can remember as a child deciding to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And I did pretty well in the first three chapters of Genesis, and then I got bogged down in chapters 4, 5, and 11 with all the begats. It was just boring and hard to understand. I had never preached on Matthew 1, 1 to 17, or any other genealogy for that matter, so I took Beat up on her challenge. And on December 22nd, 1996, I preached a sermon called, Why Not Joseph Jr., based on Jesus' family tree in the first chapter of Matthew. And actually, I remember very much enjoying working on that sermon and discovering what Matthew's message was in that genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Today, we heard Luke's genealogy of Jesus the ancestors of Jesus, 77 generations, mostly people we know nothing about, except that their names are listed in the family tree of Jesus. You might have recognized some of the more famous names as I read through that list, people like Joseph or David, Jesse and Boaz, Jacob and Isaac and Abraham, Noah, Methuselah, Adam, God, 
But that leaves 66 names of Jesus' ancestors that we really don't know much about. And actually, I think that's kind of significant for understanding who Jesus is and why he came to earth. Family trees are interesting, aren't they? My brother David in New Orleans is pretty much the family historian, genealogist. I texted him the other day and I asked him if he had our family history saved on his computer and asked him if he would email it to me. Well, he called me and he said that that was his big project for the next two years now that he's retired, but he was sorry he couldn't send me anything. And my brother loves to talk when he gets on a particular topic. He started talking to me and telling me about the pictures and the papers and the letters that he's collected on both sides of the family, the Gladden side from my dad and the Strand side from my mother. For instance, he told me about Neil McCollum, who is an ancestor of my mother's on her father's side of the family. And he described a handwritten letter the original letter from Neil McCollum that he had written home to Louisiana during the Civil War. He was stationed in the Panhandle of Florida, and he wrote about the dire conditions of the camp, how all the men were sick with dysentery and fever. And he also wrote about how worried he was that they were going to be sent to Tennessee. That's how he spelled it, Tennessee, after the first of the year. He didn't want to go to Tennessee because he would be even farther away from his home in Louisiana and he didn't feel good about it. And sure enough, Neil McCollum went to Tennessee and was killed in the Battle of Chattanooga. So family trees are interesting with their twists and their turns and their knots and their bumps. When I called my grandfather in New Orleans and told him I was going to seminary, that dyed-in-the-wool Presbyterian elder and clerk of session said, we've never had a preacher in the family before, but you know what they say. If you look back far enough anybody's family tree, you'll find a preacher and a horse thief. <laughs> and I didn't know if I'd been complimented or not. And then my grandfather laughed and he said, I'm happy for you. But his words are probably true. You can find all sorts of characters in family trees. And that's one of the interesting things about the genealogies in, of Jesus in both Matthew and Luke. Neither one of them has cleaned up these family trees for publication. The skeletons in the closet are there for everybody to see. And in a sense, I think that's something we have in common with Jesus and that he has in common with us, as I talked about in last Sunday's sermon. Woven in with the kings and the leaders of God's people and the prophets, you can read about Jesus' less stellar ancestors and people who are pretty much anonymous. And yet that doesn't take away from the importance of Jesus' family tree and its meaning for his life and the meaning for our faith. You see, Matthew traces Jesus as far back as Abraham, but Luke takes us all the way back to the beginning, to Adam, and ultimately to God himself. And the two genealogies have a deep theological purpose for the gospel writers, even more than any historical purpose. Matthew is intent in his entire gospel right from the first verse on demonstrating that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, the fulfillment of the Hebrew prophecies. That doesn't mean Jesus didn't come only for, or that Matthew thinks Jesus came only for the Jews, but that's the emphasis of his gospel. But when you get to Luke, he paints a different portrait by tracing Jesus' roots all the way back to Adam. And Luke's gospel is, in the words of the angel who spoke to the shepherds, good news of great joy for all the people. And in fact, Luke's gospel plays out that message as we read through his gospel stories about outcasts and marginalized, the women, the Samaritans, the lepers, the tax collectors, the prodigals. They're the ones who respond to Jesus' invitation to salvation. And we continue that story right on into our day. In a very real sense, we are included in that family tree, ordinary people like you and me. So let's think about that question. Why not Joseph Jr.? My father had a somewhat unusual name. His name was Adley Hogan Gladden Jr., or he went by A.H. Gladden Jr. in his business life. But actually, he was a third. 
His grandfather was named after his uncle, General Adley Hogan Gladden, who was killed in the Battle of Shiloh in Tennessee in April of 1862. My mom told me once that when she was pregnant with my big brother, she was really worried about having to name him Adley Hogan Gladden IV because she didn't want to be the one to break the line, but she didn't really want to name her son Adley Hogan Gladden IV. She said she woke up in the hospital bed after l delivering my brother and she found a telegram on the bedside table from her mother-in-law. And the telegram said, welcome to David Adley Gladden. And my mom said she was so happy my father had signed the birth certificate. So names are important. Family names, think about your name. Think about the names in your family and who you're named for. So why not Joseph Jr.? It's a good name. And in that list of 77 ancestors, that distinguished name of Joseph appears three times, which doesn't sound like much, but it appears more often than any other name. It's not as famous as David or Isaac or Jacob or Abraham, but it's three times in Jesus' family tree, and so why not Joseph Jr.? But you know the answer to that question. It's because the angel Gabriel told his parents to name him Jesus. And that's what they did when they dedicated him on the eighth day in the temple. And if you cross-check that over with Matthew's gospel, you find out from the angel that she will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so he did, and so he does, and his name is Jesus, which is Joshua, which is God saves, which is salvation, and that's why he's not Joseph Jr., so here in the South, as you well know, especially if you've moved here from somewhere else, you're most likely to be asked by someone who is meeting you for the first time, well, who are your people? Well, that's just a way to get a handle of, on who you are, start building a relationship with you. When we began our ministry at the Littleton Presbyterian Church up in Halifax County in North Carolina, a town of about 800 people, the distinguished retired bank president and church elder pulled me aside and said, Littleton is a very small town, so don't ever say anything bad about anybody in this town because the person you're talking to is probably related to them. I thought that was very good advice. Then Robert said, don't ever say anything good about anybody in this town. And I must have looked really puzzled because he said, because the person you're talking to might be mad at the person that you're talking good about, and then they'll get mad at you. <laughs> and he could only keep from laughing for so long because I guess he took pity on me as I was trying to figure out how in the world I was going to relate to the people in Littleton, North Carolina. But you know how true it is. But what I'm trying to say is Luke's family tree tells us something important about being children of God. In a sense, we can all chase, trace our roots back to child of Adam, child of God. But even more important than that is the family relationship we have with Jesus Christ, our brother in the faith. We heard Geneva read these wonderful words from 1 John 3. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Beloved, we are God's children now. The Apostle Paul makes the same point in his letter to the Galatian Christians. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male and female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Luke's family tree, you go back far enough, links Jesus back through King David which is a fulfillment of the prophet promise. And then it goes all the way back to Adam. And if you look at how the line runs the other way, Luke tells us that God, Jesus' family line runs from God, who is the father of Adam, through all of humanity, down to Jesus, 
who stands in solidarity with all humankind, including you and me, just regular, ordinary people. And those family ties are so important. There's an interesting and yet somewhat troubling story about Jesus and his family in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. Jesus was at home when some people came and told him, your mother and your brothers and your sisters are outside asking for you. And Jesus looked at all the people sitting around him and he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Which sounds like a pretty harsh story. But Jesus is talking about the family ties that bind us together as brothers and sisters in Christ that tie us to the family tree of faith that goes all the way back to Adam, all the way back to God. And those family ties should make a difference in how we live and how we act if we remember our family roots in Jesus Christ. Several years ago, Reverend David Walker, who was at the time the general presbyter of the Presbyterian of Coastal Carolina, was preaching at a meeting down in Burgaw. And I wrote down what he said in my quote journal. David said, if God is our Father, and he looked out at all of us, he said, if God is our Father, then you are my family. And that's an important reminder from this family tree of Jesus in Luke 3. The family of faith expands our own list of ancestors in our family tree, and it includes Jesus, Savior, Son of David, Son of Adam, Son of God, and that family tree extends the other way and includes our fellow believers in Christ and all of the people that Jesus died on the cross for. I remember my mom and my dad telling me as I walked out the door many, many times, remember who you are and remember where you come from. I really like the margin note next to the scripture lessons in this morning's bulletin, the quote from Alex Haley. In all of us, there's a hunger, marrow deep, to know our heritage, to know who we are and where we've come from. And that quote from Max Lucado to call yourself a child of God is one thing. To be called a child of God by those who watch your life is another thing altogether. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us remember who we are and where we've come from. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Let us pray. We thank you, O oh God, for your love for us that we should be called children of God, love that reaches out to accept us wherever we are, whoever we are. Help us, your people, who are held within the security of your love, risk showing that same love to others. May our love be known for its abundance and its grace. May others know we are your children by the love we share. Amen. As we pray to pray today, Let's continue to pray for Lee Baker, recovering from hip replacement surgery, for Judy Holly, for Andrea Castine. Um, Kat Blanchard has asked us to pray for a child of this church, Edna Blanchard White, who has had a stroke, and her family hopes that she'll be transferred to Wake Med soon. Dr. Dan's asked us to pray for a friend, Gary Moorfield, who was flooded out in River Landing, moved to Naples, Florida, and had to undergo emergency quadruple bypass surgery. And Dr. Dan shared some very upsetting news uh, right before worship. Some of you might have heard that Dan Fussell Jr. died in his sleep last night. This is Joe Ellen's husband, um, and that's all I know. Jonathan and Leah's uncle. Um, 
Joe Ellen was Natalie's fourth grade teacher. Um, so let's pray for the Fussell family. We also rejoice with Jay and Joey Fussell on the birth of their new granddaughter, daughter of Will and Shelley Fussell, Anna Sutton Ramsey Fussell, born on Tuesday. And I would ask you to pray for Wayne and Sam and Lindsay and the elders of the Grove Presbyterian Church in Kenansville and for me. Uh, we're all going to gather this afternoon for elder training, talk about uh, being leaders in the church and what we believe. And I would just ask your prayers for us as we meet today. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for calling us your children. Thank you for loving us so much that you sent Jesus Christ not only to be our brother in the faith, but our Savior, Jesus Joshua, salvation. We thank you for the history of our families. Lord, help us to know that we are part of a much bigger family in this church and around the world. Brothers and sisters in Christ, and we pray that people might see your love shining through us in how we live as your children. Lord, because we trust in Jesus Christ, we pray with assurance for the people we have named today. We continue to pray for Lee and for Nick. We thank you that she's getting stronger. We continue to pray for Judy, for Andrea, we pray that they will be strong, their bodies will be strong. Lord, we pray for Edna Blanchard White following her stroke. We pray that she'll be able to get to Wake Med and receive the care she needs. We pray for Gary Moorefield, for his family. Thank you that the doctors were able to operate we pray for his recovery, for the healing of his heart. Lord, we're shaken so much by the news of Dan Fussell's death. We pray for Joellen, for DJ, for all of their family. Lord, we ask you to lift them up, give them strength and comfort in the days and weeks to come. And Lord, we rejoice with Jay and Joey, with Will and Shelley, as they welcome Anna Sutton Ramsey Fussell. Pray for this little girl, for her parents. We ask your blessings on them, on their family. We pray that she will come to know you in her life. Lord, I thank you for this church, for your blessings, for the opportunities we have to reach out in the name of Jesus Christ. Pray for the members of this church who have been through such a hard time in the last few months. Pray that you will continue to inspire them, strengthen them, and help us know how to help. Thank you for Wayne, for Sam, for Lindsay, for all the other elders who have answered your call for service as leaders in this church. And pray for our gathering this afternoon as we talk about what we believe and how to live it out in this church and in Kenansville and in other places. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us in Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue our worship as we present our tithes and our offerings.
Philosophies have tried to stamp it out. Tyrants have tried to wash it from the face of the earth with the very blood of those who claimed it. Yet still it stands. And there shall be that final day when every voice that has ever uttered a sound, every voice of Adam's race, shall raise in one great mighty chorus to proclaim the name of Jesus for in that day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So you see, it was not mere chance that caused the angel one night long ago to say to a virgin maiden, his name shall be called Jesus. You know, there's something about that name. God who gives and then gives even more as we bring our tithes and offerings this morning. Remind us that you have also given each of us spiritual gifts, not to make us rich, but to make the world richer, more compassionate, and more just. Lord, open our eyes to those gifts and where and when you would have us use them. In the Savior's name we pray. Amen. Let us affirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our closing hymn is To God Be the Glory, number 634.
Go now, sent by the one who was sent by God, walk in the light, testify to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, forgive the sins of all, and live in peace with one another. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen.